Welcome to Wisco Dice! Hey yo folks, I'm your host, the Conzy with the most. And who all do we have here today? Brian's here, sometimes start raving man. Hello everyone, this is Justin, the Meeple's champion. And this is Suzanne. And this is Matt, the Ghost Walker. And this is episode 94 of the Wisco Dice Tabletop Gaming Podcast. Woo! I'm going to get the rest of you to cheer with me one of these times. In today's episode, we will cover games that are light, travel, and summer friendly. Our hobby corner, where we will catch up with those miniature hobby and painting projects that we've been working on. But first, let's dive into those games we've been playing. Suzanne, I'm excited to hear from you about this one. Tell us all about it. Okay, so Foundations of Rome. So this is a game we recently received that we had backed basically through Kickstarter. Uh, I had been watching this for a couple of years, checked it out at Gen Con a couple of times, very intrigued by it. Uh, so this is a game published by Arcane Wonders. It takes 60 to 90 minutes uh, without a teach. You can play one to four players in the base game. We do have the expansion, so we can play up to five players if we really want. Uh, from this group of hosts, Ben, I, and uh, Brian have all played this game a couple times. So... Foundations of Rome, if you have not heard of it yet, is a city building board game. You are competing with other architects to get the best pieces of land and build these glorious structures so that everyone will remember you uh, as you, you know, live on in infamy uh, with, <laughs> with these fabulous buildings and tributes that you have built. Uh, on your turn, you're going to select from either purchasing a new lot that's on the board building a new building in the city of Rome that is shared by all the players, or you can collect income. So, you know, every game you need to have some sort of money coming in to be able to build these uh, buildings. Each round that you have, the points are collected based on the population that you have uh, pulled into the city of Rome, commerce that you brought into it, as well as any civic buildings that you have. Uh, the neat thing with the civic buildings is those are going to score points based on where you place them Dep and other players uh, buildings that they've also placed are going to contribute to your point score. So you can have some strategy with where you're going to place uh, to maximize what other players are doing. So one thing to note with this game is that it is a big box. It is well over, I think a foot <laughs> on each side uh so it's this larger than a cubic foot box but it's really cool because it makes setup super quick each player has their own tray you just kind of pull out the out of there and then you pull the board out and one two three you're ready to go and, and along with this easy setup the play is fairly intuitive iconography i found very easy to understand with it so teaching this to first time players can go very smoothly um i'm hoping others have found that to be the same yeah brian and, how how does teaching this game go <laughs> yeah it's probably one of the few i've actually taught in a long time i think that breaks down a lot to well it is like laid out really well and everything's kind of right there there's really only like those three main actions you kind of repeat the whole whatever the whole gameplay through so that just makes it really easy. You can just do one of three things. You explain those things. And also there's really good like points reference and breakdown for how the scoring works in each round. And I don't know, it's just kind of simple yet engaging and quick. Right, exactly. That's what I found too, is that it is very simple to explain. There's that strategy that's built in after you kind of understand the basic mechanics of it and which course you want to take if you want to pursue uh, going through more with uh, population and getting points based on your population or points based on where other people are grabbing things. So you do, there is a mild amount of player interaction because of that. One other thing that at first 
I was kind of on the fence about with this game is that, like I said, it takes up a lot of space, this box on your shelf. Like, you need to have dedicated space for it. Of all these miniatures. These miniatures, though, really make, to me, make the gameplay really neat. They add a feel of um, constructing the city. They're all, you know, unique. Like, there's a fountain, or there's an apartment building, or whatever it is. So, that's really cool to me, too. Um, component quality, I thought that it was pretty nice with the components. Cards are decent quality. I mean, they're not, like blow me away but they are not gonna they're not getting bent after the first couple plays um the miniatures kind of fit nicely the board scales easily i don't know what um ben and brian what you thought about the components you well, okay think, with uh, them yeah for sure like the minis of the buildings are just like completely over the top i think that's like the defining feature of the game really is just how like crazy detailed all those minis are yeah, and you kind of really can tell and you feel like it's it does add a really nice aspect to the game, I think, with your saying, hey, yeah. I'm building this theater and it's a theater that you're putting up. Yeah, I think that adds a lot. Like, if it wasn't for the minis, I think that would probably kind of have some diminishing returns on the gameplay or whatever if you're just, you know, putting your Tetris-shaped pieces out there. Like, I think that's really what is... The big thing with the game is the minis. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. This is this is only a average to below average game. I think if it wasn't for the components and the and the elaborate storage system and and uh, all of the little bonus add-ons that they've added on the little modules that they've added on to the game. If you're just playing it base game, the one to four player. It's it was fun. I, I enjoyed the base four player game, but you know the elaborateness of it, the components, it all made it pop. If those were just little boring cardboard wedges and and whatnot, I don't think I would I would have appreciated it nearly as much. But the the real interesting part of Foundations of Rome is when you start adding in the modules, and the modules don't seem to take the game into that much more complex gameplay, but just add in different things like the monument module or the like secret goal module or uh, the there's another module that can let you steal lots from your opponents. And so these all these all add, I think, to the to the overall depth of what uh, of, of this game and make it far, far better than it. Uh, uh, actually was but without those miniatures i just it would not hit the awesomeness that it does with without the miniatures it would remind me a lot of uh, the game my city it's kind of tetris like and has just the cardboard little cutouts for the different buildings and you don't really feel like you're putting certain you know building different components of a city that you need with these expansions that ben was mentioning nice thing with them i've not played with the expansions yet uh but i've read through them and the nice thing i'm seeing is that depending on the group you are playing with you can modify the game to be an enjoyable experience with them because there is that um bit of uh backstabbiness that could come from different groups if you are Blocking the land. If you if you have someone that is intentionally trying to take parts of lot and lots that someone else is going to need, and if you have a group that that's not okay with, then you don't pick an expansion that has that extra backstabby and stealing it with it. And if you have a game, if you have a group um, that like I'm part of, where hey, attacking other people is just fun, um, then you <laughs> then you add that in, and then just know that I'm going to attack you. Whether I win or not, it's just fun that way. Uh, so replayability, I think Ben and Brian kind of touched on that a little bit. Do I'm seeing that it's something fun to play with, kind of keep teaching the new players, and there's lots of different options for strategy to try out. Uh, what do you guys think about replayability with this game? Are you looking forward to playing it again? Teaching it to more people, Brian? I would definitely play it again. I think the like the modules can add some interest. Like if you don't use them all right away, like 
I think I only played with the monuments or whatever, so there's still plenty more to try there, and that could liven up the gameplay too. It seems like most of the other ones add a lot of like player interaction, which could make for some different games. And I guess the other thing is like it's a really quick play time, and since it's pretty quick to teach too, like it would be a pretty good like filler game on like a game day or something like that, since it doesn't take too long. You never think about taking out a giant box for a filler game, but yeah, it is kind of, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, with the, like, the, I was really impressed with how it all packs in there. Like, you literally just have to pull it out of the box and it's ready to go. So they did a really good job with that. Like, they could have just jumbled all the pieces in there or never, but, like, that improves the speed that you can bust it out at. So it was really cool. Yes. And you have any thought, final thoughts on this game? I think it's a solid game. Uh, I've gotten three or four plays now of it. I enjoyed all of those plays. I have a lot of content still in the giant box because we have the giant everything box uh, from the Kickstarter. So there's lots of extra modules and whatnot to try out. And it's one of the few Kickstarters that I think I own uh, that I've backed as a, like an all-in pledge, where I actually feel very strongly that I'm actually going to get to play all of the all-in content. Uh, I don't know about the rest of the world, but I have a whole room of library of board game library where the expansions, you know, of all-in pledges, Conan, Season One, Batman, many many uh, Zombicide-backed Kickstarters. <laughs> <laughs> too many of these games to count where uh you get you get excited you get that fomo going you got to got to ha- you know fear of fear of losing out you know you're and so you back it you get all that content and then it all shows up and you're like oh my god it's so awesome i have like all of these expansions and whatnot and then you only only ever play it a few times of the base game and never get never get to all the rest of that content. So this is definitely a game where I feel like that's going to be, and it's going to be easy to do that. I feel enabled to be able to do it, and I feel excited to be able to do that. So it's uh, definitely something I think will get on the table. How long long term this game perpetuates? That's yet to be seen. I don't. I I I wasn't. I, I was. Ex- I'm excited for the game. I think it's really cool, but it do- it's not a game. Like I said, I think I. I hinted at it earlier. The game itself is almost too simplistic in the base game format for all of the elaborateness of, of the game. That said, I, I like the comment about it being a great filler. I think that's a way that it may get to the table more often, especially on bigger game days when you, you're waiting for other tables to finish and you need them to kill an hour. It's a, I think it's going to be a great way to fill that hour. And one last thought I was just thinking of with the, we don't often talk about it, but the elaborateness comes at a price in this instance. Like, it is a rather expensive game, I think you were saying. Yeah. Yes. That was one of the drawbacks for me every time I was looking at it. It was, you're paying for the minis, which definitely add to the game experience. It is not a cheap game it's not a hey i've got some extra money i'm gonna buy this type of game really it's a you really have to think before you buy it um i will say to ben's point about like how often this is gonna get played i see this as hey we're gonna play it for you know a bunch of times this year and next year and after that it may come out once a year and in the future when my daughter starts bringing home potential significant others this is a game that we can sit down and play and see if they you know at least pass some basic gaming tests with so <laughs> that that's how i'm judging my uh, daughter's dates is uh, and boyfriends is girlfriends whoever they are is based on if they can play games so so, so ben's not going to make them sit through Catan? probably uh, not I don't think I could sit through Catan with him trying to teach them and then play it. So I, we don't own a copy of Catan anymore. So yes, we'd have to come Aha. over and see you, Matt. <laughs> and then you'd have well, to suffer with Well, at least somebody me. held on to it. <laughs> All right. So I think that is our thoughts on Foundations of Rome.
Well, I had one this week, uh, this month, excuse me, that I want to talk about called Fantastic Factories. Fantastic Factories is a game from Meta Factory Games. It uh, plays in 45 to 60 minutes and for one to five players. I believe I'm the only one that's played it here. Fantastic Factories is a fast playing engine building game, card game. Uh, where players use dice as workers each round to generate resources, construct buildings that develop into an engine. And then ideally you end up producing more goods and points from your buildings than your opponents. Just as a quick summary of how it works, uh, every round of the game happens in two phases. You get your market phase where players take turns either taking new blueprints which become buildings to create an engine or hiring contractors for a special one-time ability that can provide a one-time bonus like getting an extra worker die for that round or some resources but you do have to discard cards from your limited hand of cards to get those special bonuses Um, the blueprints that you draft then become part of your engine that get used in the next phase which is the work phase So in the work phase, everybody rolls their four worker dice simultaneously and then runs their engine. You can gather basic resources from your headquarters just to gain energy and metal that you need to build these other uh, building cards. Uh, You can get more cards by doing research, researching new blueprints. Uh, And then you get to run your engine by activating all the buildings that you've got in play uh, that round. Some buildings require you to use a worker and place a worker with a certain value on them to trigger. So like one building might let you generate some metal if you place a six value dice on it. Um, Other buildings might just be activated by paying some costs. You pay three energy and then you can draw a couple cards or something like that, depending on the building. You also get to play those blueprints that you picked up in the market phase into your uh, play area as part of your engine. So you basically just have to pay some resource cost of metal and energy, and then also discard a different building or blueprint of the same type. So you're always having to kind of make tough decisions about what card do I really want in my engine and what can I afford to discard to be able to play this other one. And you're basically able to chain actions together through your engine by taking the output of one building that you activate to then pay the cost for another one and activate that one. Uh, which might let you draw more blueprint cards, which you could then play that turn and activate those buildings and so on. It's a nice little engine building game. To to win the game, you're either going to be producing goods, which are worth a point each, or uh, each of the buildings that you play is also worth points. So you basically are just trying to produce as much goods as you can and get high value buildings. Early on, you're going to be buying buildings that might have a lower VP cost because they're really good for your engine. But then later on, as you kind of build up that decent engine, You might be looking at those more expensive monument type buildings that are really about scoring towards the end of the game. Game ends when one player has produced 12 goods or played 10 building cards. You play one more round and tally up the points. This is just a nice, light, quick and fun engine building game. It's a great introduction to engine building games. It isn't going to drive someone crazy with iconography like say roll for the galaxy or race for the galaxy i should say which is a great game but hard to teach to somebody this game has super clean uh iconography very easy to learn and it's just a blast uh when i played uh recently we also played with the manufactions expansion which gives you some corporations that you can get at the beginning of the game that give you these asymmetrical powers which is super cool uh as well as new cards a new resource called vitamins which adds some uh dice mitigation where you can you know increase or decrease the value of your workers every round um and it just blends really well into the base game i think i i don't think i'd ever play it just base game with anymore with now that this expansion's out um there's another expansion too called subterfuge which is, adds some of the attacky stuff that suzanne might like uh take that mechanics and just a lot of player interaction uh so if that's your thing too i would look into that expansion as well i hope to get this one out to play with you guys sometime but uh that's uh uh fantastic factories a great engine builder it sounds like a lot of fun i do have a question and i think it's probably worthwhile to lay to kind of 
define or, or talk about it a little bit, and that's engine building. So I think you use that term uh, several times here, and, and just try to for those of those of you out there that aren't board game speak literate, <laughs> what what yep. what does engine building really mean? What are we talking about here? Is this you know are we literally uh, Get, putting together bolts and casting metal parts and building ourselves a, 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 an engine that's going to uh, power some vehicle or or ma- uh, <laughs> spit out widgets. What what do we what do you mean here? In some games, that might be it, but yeah, <laughs> in, in in board game in board game terminology, this is a great question, uh, and it's a good point to kind of to to clarify this a little. Uh, uh, an engine building game is a game where um, you kind of start out with basic access to maybe some some resources in a lot of games it might be something like stone and wood right or uh in this it's energy and metal and you have inefficient ways of getting those resources in the beginning of the game and then as you play you gain access to actions and or in this case cards buildings that produce those resources or give you access to better actions so you add something to uh, your kind of tableau of stuff that you can do and that is more efficient. And then you can uh, use that to do to gain another action or another card that provides another efficiency. And you can chain those together in a string of combos. And so ultimately, the goal is to find those efficiencies to build a sequence of actions that results in a way to continuously produce victory points, whatever the victory points are in the game. And this case it's goods so some cards in the game produce goods and so i need a way to get from like metal and energy to more buildings to buildings to produce goods and then continually activate those buildings to produce goods in an efficient way and building your engine is just creating an efficient chain of activities and actions uh in a sort of optimal way um and it has you sort of have this build up and progression feeling in engine building games uh, if you got anything to add to that, please too. Really. <laughs> no, so I was gonna, I was just gonna say, so in a game like this, and I, I, I haven't played it, and I don't really know the game, but for example, you're, you might, you're, uh, you might have a, a starting action that lets you spend three energy and a metal to buy a basic building, right? But that basic building all of a sudden lets you then create new energy that you can then use to build the next building um yep. uh, whereas uh whereas in, the only way you think you might be able to gain energy at the beginning of the game is to spend maybe two metal to gain one energy now you have a building that'll just give you an energy as an action or something yeah uh, exactly. that's you got the basic idea yeah with it yep mm-hmm. so yeah, that's kind of how that the... relates and you continue to stack that ability, those abilities up and up and up. Yes, exactly. All um, right. Say, so, while Justin has been describing it, I've been very intrigued in looking at this game on um, Board Game Geek. The iconography you mentioned, is it being clear? And I was like, you know, sometimes it's clear when you're playing the game, but it's really not clear. Oh my gosh, this looks super straightforward and clear on these cards and super excited to try this game out when <laughs> when we're able to do that so yeah the the design is cool i wish i could you know uh, describe it better but it's uh really clean sort of uh a, a cartoony bright um but just just crisp clear artwork it just has a really cool look to it it's unique and yeah it, it, i think yeah, really easy to understand. So a great kind of gateway game, I think. But really, there's a lot of depth to it as well. There's a huge deck of of different cards, and so like you could spend a lot of time finding the cool combos and strategies. So yeah. we're gonna have to have a game night where we break out Foundations of Rome and Fantastic Factories all in the same night, so we can just play all these little filler games one big night. <laughs> yeah, filler game night, good idea. All right. And with that, I think we've uh, uh, gotten to the end of the games that we've been playing. So if you want to find out more information about any of these games, make sure you go to wiscodice.com. Hey, Brian, what was that website? I think it was wiscodice.com. 
Are you sure, Matt? What's that website? Pretty sure it's wiscodice.com. All right. I'll take you guys' word for it. But uh, So just go to wiscodice.com for links to the games that we discussed, as well as pictures and all that kind of good stuff. But with that, let's dive into the photo-friendly hobby corner, and I'll go ahead and kick that right off with talking about the hobby and uh, gaming projects that I've been working on, uh, and that is the Batman two-player starter based on the film, The Batman, the amazing, the awesome, okay, really good Batman movie that just came out with the Batman actor that I'm probably not as big of a fan of. But uh, the rest of the movie was amazing. Uh, this game is, uh, the starter is uh, was produced by Night Models. They actually are out of print on their online web store. But as of when we were recording, the last I checked, uh, our local friendly game store, Noble Knight Games, still had copies in their online store that you could get it from. So, I don't know, there's a ridiculous amount of figures in it. But I got the whole starter box built, so I have all the figures. Actually, I Oh, let me I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll take a step back. I do not have the whole starter box that built. I have all but two models. I don't have Carmine Falcone and then the cop that's on a horse uh, built yet from that set. Uh, but I actually also got uh, the twins are painted, and I almost have Mafia uh, Thug or whatever the th- one of the that's other true. goons in that box. Uh, Thug Three, I think, is uh, uh, painted up or nearly painted now. So. I'm trying to get that all set up so I can start doing some demos with the kit and uh, with that starter because I think that's uh, going to be a great way to get people excited uh, for this awesome miniature game. So, but yeah, that's that's really kind of where I'm at hobby wise. I'm super excited for more Batman miniature game, and those of you that aren't uh, playing it on this podcast should totally think about it. Uh, anyways, that's what I've been working on. So, yeah, I'll continue on with the trend of Batman awesomeness. Um, I also picked up the starter from Noble Knight, but I just got it Monday, and I have unboxed it, but I have not made any progress on it like you have been. <laughs> yeah, have you actually gotten the Back to Gotham starter box all assembled? Uh, I was trying to remember if I put together anybody from that box. Was Deadshot in that box? Yeah, so I put yes. Deadshot. He's done. But nah, not the rest of the box. You do all the Joker, and Matt does all the Batman, so I don't need those guys right now. (laughs) Someday. But I think it was last episode I was working on Goliath, and happy to say, fairly quickly after that episode, I finished up Goliath. That was a pretty fun big model to paint, and still been hyped on Batman, so I was trying to branch out to kind of switching up or expanding crews some. So I am currently working on the Blackgate Prisoners. The idea is to have those paired with the Bane uh, League of Assassins crew from like the Dark Knight Rises box. So I'm still on whatever. Was that a second edition starter technically? (laughs) I might have half of that done pretty soon. But I don't know, I'm pretty hyped to be working on those. Um, I, I don't know, I might be like... I was originally thinking I'd maybe do the prisoners like one at a time or whatever, but obviously they're all pretty similar with their orange jumpers and all that stuff. So, And limited colors, they're busting out pretty fast. So that's cool. Oh, I guess one other thing I was messing around with trying to figure out cards for these guys because they don't really have uh, second edition, well, third edition rather, like cards actually from Night Models. So... A lot of people in the community have actually like made some, but I don't know, some of them were a little funky and I didn't find any that I super liked. So I actually am like trying to figure out printing some bootleg cards or whatever. Like I kind of based them off of somebody's what somebody else had done, but I'm tweaking them a little bit and actually like just doing like screen grabs from the app, which is pretty cool for getting like the face of the card. And then I think I have the back of the card figured out pretty well. So We'll see if I can get some. I'm sure just even printing them on a regular printer, color printer, and putting them in a sleeve will be perfectly fine for gameplay. But I'm kind of interested to see how that works out. So I was kind of messing with that after work here and there at the computer. Is that just the prisoner cards? 
the the cards that you're that you're uh, working on is that just the prisoners or? Um. Well, the prisoners, and then also the uh, Bane crew. I guess those ones. Are, the Bane crew is actually like has a PDF on um, Night Models website, but they don't actually have like the back of the cards, which is kind of handy because it has all the rules on them. So those ones are a little easier to like get good pictures of the fronts or whatever, but. Uh, okay. or at least I think they are. I might even be wrong on that. I'd have to double check because I was only like working on the prisoners ones currently, which only have like the app or uh, kind of community made ones. But in theory, I'm trying to get like a good base where taking screen grabs from the app or from the website, I can kind of make whatever card because even like the new starter box i was really surprised like i guess most models new models haven't been coming with cards at all so while the app doesn't quite have the gameplay functionality like all the rules are in there but i don't know how they expect you to like you know track all your damage or other markers and stuff like that without the card is kind of an inconvenient drawback of the game at the moment yeah yeah I'm, i'm not sure there either but uh think uh hopefully the app will be expanded to allow us to do that in the future i figured like if i take the time to like make up some nice cards that's about when the app will pick up that functionality so that's what happened with second edition i made those nice trays to hold all the dice and everything and then <laughs> like i don't think i even used them in one game and then like third edition was announced coming out so that was hilarious so if you need second edition Batman trays, I can hook you up. <laughs> but that sums up my hobby. Yeah, I'm I'm still in the planning stages of a, a we're going to be building a game table. Um, we we had I I decided to do this thing called vacation, which it, everybody tells me is overrated, but uh, did a small vacation, and then uh, we were debating whether we were going to uh, you know build a bigger house for our game collection or, or as Ben tells me, you got to do it the other way around. You've got to build the house, you know, so that you can have the bigger game collection. But uh, now I'm a little more focused and my wife and I are still in the debate process on the plans, but uh, hoping to finalize the plans and actually get some lumber. So we're going to try to finish up the plans here in the next month and uh, get some lumber in the house. And uh, I've been picking up a couple of tools so that I have a, uh, uh, a few things that will make the table go together quicker. So, uh, you know, hopefully we'll have some stuff going on here that uh, we'll not just talk about it here, but we'll try to get some blog posts up on the Wisco Dice. So, going to sell the blueprints for the Wisco Dice by Matt game table. <laughs> no, no, my wife keeps my wife keeps <laughs> telling me after we, after she keeps staring at all these other companies that are doing it. She's like, maybe we should do that for a living. So. I, I told her I'm going to need a bigger house just to put the shop in for that. <laughs> we happen to know where there's a house right down the street for sale. <laughs> uh, but anyways, yes, build the house. You need to build or own the house with plenty of space to store the games because paying to move your 600 plus game collection a couple of times in a, in sub five years gets expensive in a hurry. <laughs> All right. And with that, Make sure that you check out whiskodice.com for pics of all of our projects. And let's go ahead. At this point, we'll take a break. And when we come back, we'll dive into that main topic, talking about our light, summer, and travel-friendly games. Hey folks, this is the Conzie of the Most. I just wanted to take a moment to tell you about Misty Mountain Games here in Madison, Wisconsin, where you can find CCGs, RPGs, board games, minis, paint and hobby supplies for your all of your tabletop gaming experience and needs. If you can't find it online, give them a phone call or swing on by their brick and mortar store uh, here on the east side of Madison. Don't worry, that is MistyMountainGames.com. Check them out today. And we're back! Yay! Ooh. Hey, all right, I got a cheer. That's amazing. We're getting better. 
It's summer, and that means it's travel, barbecue, and outdoor activity season. That doesn't mean that it's time for the gaming to just end in favor of days at the beach or sitting in the sun. Whether you are on the go or stuck inside for a rainy day, there are so many great games that are perfect for summer gaming. We're going to dive into our list of games that we feel either capture the theme of summer well or great games to just travel with, or games that might even work out well to play outside. Game number three. So I'm going to kick that off with Hive from Gen 42 Games, which features game pieces that are not only heavy and plastic, with no game board or cardboard components. It makes it game pieces that are nearly indestructible so you don't have to worry about them getting wet, dirty, banged or or destroyed in a back t- backpack or a plastic baggie, Ziploc baggie or however you decide you want to transport this game while you're on a trip. Um, it's easy to take with you because you can stow it in such a small small bag. It really is just the game components are the pieces and they can just happily jump around the board and try to surround the opponent's queen. Now, let, let's not forget that Hive is a two-player game that features all of those wonderful summer insects that uh, uh, you want to hang out with you and that are playing out there with you while you're playing the game. And your goal is to basically, uh, I don't know, have the dominant insect nation or something. I'm not even sure. The game the game doesn't even really define what the goal is other than you're half supposed to have all of your insects around the opponent's queen, and if you do that, you win. Yeah, it is a highly highly strategic tactical two player game. If you're into games like chess or checkers, this is a great game like that. But it travels far far more easily. And heck, I even I even think you could play this underwater if you really wanted to. So <laughs> you, you know this this game this game is like I said, it's nearly indestructible. It's a great summer game, and of course. Uh, has the theme of insects, which will always be around in summertime. All right, so my number three game, is, uh, I'm going to actually start first by saying honorable mention for me for all of these games is playing on uh, Board Game Arena. So for the summer, that's kind of, hey, I'm sitting relaxing outside. I love being outside. We're in Wisconsin. It's cold and snow like a good chunk of the year so board game arena or other digital type games is great but number three for physical games is abandon all order chokes by game right games uh this is a card game for two to four players it takes only about like 20 minutes to play uh it's really cool because the rules are just written on the card so it's a card game um the object is to draw a five card hand at the end of your turn that does not contain any artichokes you're trying to abandon them all get them out of your garden uh, it comes in a nice artichoke shaped tin but it's not heavy it's really easy to just stick in a bag and take with you like i said all the directions for this game when you're teaching it is like here read the cards that are in your hand and figure out what to do so it's just a super fun relaxing silly little game to play so that is my number three is abandoned all chunks. That's right, it's Jaws. <laughs> my number three is a summer blockbuster. It's Jaws from Ravensburger. <laughs> Jaws is uh, an asymmetrical cooperative game for two to four players. Uh, one player plays as the shark. While everybody else gets to play one of three human crew uh, members. Quint, Brody, and Hooper are the other characters. And it happens in two acts. So in act one, the shark swims around Amity Island using hidden movement mechanics to avoid detection by the humans and eat as many unsuspecting swimmers as they can. Uh, the crew, on the other hand, tries to track the shark uh, by putting motion detectors in the water, they close beaches to try to save swimmers, and generally try to prevent as many you know people from getting eaten by the shark. In Act Two, 
you flip the board over and it all takes place on Quint's boat, the Orca. And so in this phase, the shark basically is under the water, kind of circling around the boat and will basically surface in a certain location and then attack the boat or the crew. The uh, the crew tries to predict where the shark's going to surface and then attack it with whatever weapons that they have. And the sort of strength and capabilities of each player in that second act depends on how well they did in the first act. So if the shark has eaten a ton of swimmers, they're going to get all these bonus shark ability cards and be even harder to defeat in the second act. But if the humans, the uh, crew, manages to really fend the shark off in act one, they've got a bunch of extra stuff to help them defeat the shark in the second act. Uh, the game ends when either the shark eats all the crew, destroys the boat, or if the crew manages to do enough damage and wound the shark enough to kill it. Um, this is just a fun, uh, light, but still pretty interesting and strategic uh, asymmetrical game. I mean, who doesn't want to play as Jaws and like swim around and eat the swimmers and attack the boat? It's cool. It's a cool game. This is also one of those ones that you. This is also one of those ones that you can uh, find at Target. It's one of those Target games uh, you can get pick up for pretty cheap, and it's actually decent. Like it's a it's a decent game. So. Mm-hmm. Sounds only interesting. ever want to play as a shark. <laughs> yeah, this does not surprise us, Ben. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm tasty swimmers. So my third from this time is uh, a game called Trash Pandas, which is made by Game Right Games. Uh, if you happen to be going north and you decide your family wants to get away and do some camping or something, odds are you'll have to deal with some of these wonderful creatures, the trash pandas, uh, otherwise known as raccoons, for those of you who uh, are, don't hang out in, uh, in areas where they are located. Uh, basically, uh, you play as one of these raccoons, and it's really a dice rolling card trick style game where you're trying to press your luck and see how far you can get. Uh, you know, you roll dice and then you get certain tokens that allow you to do certain things, gather cards, uh, store cards, and you and, and you can even use those cards not only to gather points, which is many times done by having the most of a certain type of card, uh, but it also allows you to each one of the car. Some of the cards have special abilities that lets you basically disrupt other people or grab certain cards or, or do certain actions as well. So it's kind of that risk versus reward. Do I save this card and use it against somebody else or to save myself? Or do I want to score points with that card? Will I have enough cards stored that I can, you know, have more than the person next to me? Um, it is a relatively short game. It comes in a small box, uh, you know, you could easily stick it in a bag and take it with you on vacation. Um, and it really takes, it, it can take two to four players and really supports, it, it can be played in 20 minutes. So it's something, you know, if you're stuck inside, super easy. Even if you have to go outside, it, it, it's not very hard to set up. Uh, just rel- super easy, even with it, if you, are, you have a family and you're trying to have something light and easy for the kids to play, if some of your kids are a little younger, super fun, easy to play with the kids. So that's my number three game. Game number two. All right, summer is the time for growing vegetables. That's why Point Salad from AEG is the perfect summer game. For two to six players... I think it plays a bit better with groups of three or more, but hey, whatever size, it's got a big, nice group. So whether you're playing playing games with the family, uh, which can be bigger gatherings, or you're just on a camping or hiking trip uh, with just uh, your significant other, it's got pl- plenty of player count to meet all of those needs. At its core, it's a fast card drafting and set collection game. The rules are easy to understand and teach. It's fast. It's small travel size. Makes it perfect to sneak it in between quick swims or a break while you're taking a hike or even while you're snacking on a picnic. It's it's just a great little game. Uh, Honestly, I wish I got it to the table more often than I do because it's... All about vegetables. And after all, 
eating your vegetables is good for you. So my number two is Fantasy Realms, uh, which is by WizKids. It's a card game for two to six players. It's a nice small travel size box. You can pop this in your backpack, uh, you know, if you're going camping or or just, uh, you know, uh, traveling. It is essentially a, a card drafting combo making game. Everybody starts with a hand of seven cards that come from 10 different suits like beasts or flames or artifacts or weapons. And you are trying to build the perfect combo of hands by the end of the a perfect combo of cards in your hand by the end of the game to maximize your points. Cards have a value from like zero to 40 or more. And then every card also has a scoring condition that interacts with other cards uh, and, and suits in various ways. So for example, the wand card gives you plus 25 points if you also have an, a wizard, some wizard suit card in your hand. The forest card gives you plus 12 for every beast that you also have in your hand. And plus 12, you also have elven archers, one of the other cards. Uh, and some are more complicated, like the blizzard says blanks all flood suit cards, which basically means those cards don't do anything. They're worth they're worthless in your hand or all their negatives and positives are gone. And then you also would take minus five points for every army leader, beast and flame card. So it's really about working with what you have and finding a way to turn the, the conditions of every card into points in some way. You get a chance every round to draw a new card or choose from one face up to, to improve your hand every two round. And you just try to perfect your hand and find combos uh, uh, that work together with all, with all the cards that you have. A nice, light, uh, quick card drafting game for, for two to six. That's uh, Fantasy Realms. All right. So Fantasy Realms sounds very interesting. My number two is a series of games because I couldn't just pick one of these, but they are the Mint series of games. Uh, I, I think it's 524 Labs, I think is the new name of the publisher for them. Um, they changed from Poketo. So these are six games that are each come in the size of a mint tin. So think of like your Altoids or other mints you can buy at the checkouts. So that's how big these tins are. Each of them has very similar components with some cards and some few things, and then wooden discs that are made to look like mints. They're the size of those mints you would normally stick in your mouth. Um, so they're great to slip into your pants pocket, your bag. Uh, I have one in the glove box of my car. A lot of times I'll carry one in my purse just so that we have something to play. If we show up somewhere, uh, we're waiting, we want to throw something out on the table. They're great for that. I initially saw these on Kickstarter, like $10 a game. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is kind of cool because I am looking right now for travel games that are, you know, a little bit more complex or have a little bit more to them than like, um, what's it, Travel Connect 4 or those other games you'll find at Target sometimes that are travel family games. So I have per backed... <laughs> Now, all six of the games, I believe, that are out there, so they're, and they're all very different. If you want a cooperative one, you get mint cooperative. If you want something that's a little bit more um, worker placement, there's mint works. Territory control. That's what it's called, mint control. Uh, you have mint delivery, where you are running different types of mints and candies around this city map that you create. If you like bidding or auction mechanics, which are not my favorite, but I had to complete the set. So I backed Mint Bid. We got that. And then Mint Mini is the newest one and I think is the only one I have not convinced Konzi and my daughter to play with me yet. But I'm really looking forward to it. So that is my number two. My number two is actually six games, uh, but definitely ones you can grab and stick and you know carry along with you and just pull out when you're at the bar or at the beach or wherever you go in the summer so that is my number two just make sure when you grab your copy of mint that you're not throwing those mint like components in your mouth and eating oh, them by the way they do not taste very good <laughs> i may or may not have accidentally done that so you will know from the taste all right. Yeah. All right. What do you have, Matt? So I picked one that is 
shockingly, like Suzanne, not just one game, but many games. Um, one of my favorites to pull out from time to time, um, there's, an, there's a base level game called Flux by Looney Labs. And there are so many different flavors of Flux. The beautiful thing about Flux is you can really pick your favorite theme. You can pick your favorite, you know, whatever, and just pick up the, the version of the game that you like. Um, there's a version based on Alice in Wonderland. There's Doctor Who, Star Trek, Space. There's fantasy versions. There's all sorts of different versions of Flux that you can pick up. But really, at it, at its heart, it's a card game. Uh, it's roughly the size of, I'd say, anybody who's ever seen and purchased a, a you know, the double decks of cards. It's basically that size of box. And the thing about Flux is it is a card game where the rules keep changing. It starts out with two very basic cards. You basically have draw a card, play a card. And you may have cards in your hand that lets people draw 10 cards or one card or no cards, or you can only keep your hand to a certain size. And the rules keep changing as, you, as the game goes on, including how you win. So somebody may, you may think that you're not doing very well and suddenly somebody plays a card and you can win the game in a very short period of time. Um, it's a fun, quick game, super easy to pull out and set up and it can support up to two to six players and they really say, and they mean it and I've seen it happen, you can play anywhere from five minutes to, to really like about a half an hour. For a single uh, round of the game, um, it's just a fun, light, easy card game. Something that even if you have somebody who doesn't play a lot of games, they could figure out the rules really quick. Um, so you can teach it real easy, and it's not very hard to carry with you. So I, I just like it because it's a fun, light game. And like I said, you can pick whatever flavor you like. You don't have to play the base flux. You can play space or fantasy or whatever you like. What's what's your favorite version of Flux? Um, I think the there, there's a space. Uh, well, the two that I really like there's a space Flux that we have and we play, and my son picked up the Doctor Who version of Flux that was really good too. So right. uh, I'm a big fan of both, and they're both a lot of fun. Suzanne, what's your favorite version of Flux? I was just going to say, we have the Doctor Who version, and it is fun. I will say one thing is if you are not a Doctor Who fan, and the combinations are maybe not as interesting in it. I like zombie flux. Oh, so, you know, it's just, it's silly. You're eaten by things and it's just very feeling like a zombie. Like you're in one of those cheesy zombie movies. Justin, what's your favorite flux? I think the only one I've ever played is the Monty Python version. <laughs> So oh, that's, that's my favorite because that's what I played. It also it was it's funny. It's got a lot of great stuff. In it. Yeah, there's yep. definitely a lot of cool, quick change to the game. Yep, I'm a zombie flux kind of guy. So Cthulhu flux is pretty good. Zombie flux though is better. <laughs> game number one. I can't help. But think of the Mediterranean Sea and the beautiful cities that border it when I think of summer. Like, when I picture summer, that is, like, just what pops in my brain. To that, the game Santorini from Roxley Games is that perfect, beautiful Greece city, but in this really awesome tactical board game for two to four players. The rules are are very simple. You're you're just moving one of your pawns and then adding a piece to the game board. That's really all you're doing on your turn. And the goal is to get one of your two pawns to the third level of buildings before your opponent's team can. So that's all you have to do. Your team's got to beat the other team. The components are all plastic. They're durable. The box is not very huge, so you can jam it in a backpack. Gameplay is not super long. It's one of those games you can take with you while you're sitting on the beach, pop it out quick while you're uh, maybe uh, enjoying a cool cocktail and and lays, lays back and just build this beautiful little Mediterranean uh, city, you know, in board game form while you're enjoying a nice summer afternoon. 
I, can I just say it's a brain bendy game for me because it's very much like chess where you have to plan what your opponent's going to do potentially too. So I agree. It's very summary, but it's also, I don't know for me, it's very stressful, <laughs> 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 but do not let that hold you back. I am not a chess player. I have to have my cheat sheet for how to play chess and we'll never anyone other than someone under the age of 12 months on that game so chess was my honorable mention for this list actually <laughs> so, all right i'm gonna say my number one is reef so oh my gosh if you guys have not played reef you need to go and look at it it's just these bright colors these nice plastic components of coral that you are stacking that don't tip over you can play with two to four players you can play it in less than an hour and then you know what you're going to want to play it again after you play it because if you lose you are going to want a rematch and if you win you are going to want a rematch to prove that you are the superior reef player um, in this game you are creating this bright coral reef on your game board and you're trying to match these patterns on cards that you are drawing. It's a very tactile game. Um, you got, you know, it's also one that if you get sand in it, you dip it in water and you can rinse it off if you want to. Or if you spill your drink on it, you might get the board sticky, but the rest of it you can clean off. Um, the giant size pieces are like, I call them giant, but they're they're not. They're like, I don't know, an inch, inch and a half square size pieces of coral. Um, it doesn't blow around. You can stack it. Ben and I uh, took it when we went to Putukan in the Dominican Republic recently. And we played it, and it was a great, nice game to play poolside. does have some mid-level strategy in it, but it's still lightweight enough. You're relaxed, and you just can't help but smile when you play this game. So Reef is my number one summertime game that if you want to play it, I will definitely say yes. Game is a colorgasm. <laughs> yeah, I've played it with you guys at least once. It's a, it is a very bright, colorful game. Doesn't it make you smile when you see it? It's been a few months, but yeah, it was a. It, no, it was, some games are just like that. They're just so colorful and bright and. Some might say it's so colorful it could be considered garish in its colors, but uh Oh uh, no. that wouldn't be you though. So No, not I actually this love one. the game though. I love the game. This was also a possible honorable mention on my list, so uh so my number one uh is a game that features it's it's a light game that features light summer food. That's Sushi Go. Sushi Go is by Game Right. And it's a kid-friendly card drafting game with super cute illustrations of Japanese food. Each player is trying to collect different sets of different types of sushi or those kinds of foods, uh, you know, to meet the the scoring conditions for for that type of food. So, for example, every pair of tempura you grab uh, on your turn, draft a, car, a tempura card. If you get a pair of them, it's five points dumplings if you have one of them they're worth one point but if you have four of them it's 10 points five is 15. maki rolls if you start picking those up basically the player who has the most of them at the end of the round will is the only one that's going to score for those so it's just a nice quick card drafting game you can teach the kids or anybody it comes in a little travel size tin like most of the game right games do it's just really fun um, and if you want to go even harder on, on the Sushi uh, Go game, you can get a little more board gamey, but less travel friendly uh, with Sushi Go Party, where there's even more options. You customize your game each each uh, time you play with different cards that are included. Uh, and so you can kind of get a totally different gameplay experience every time with the Sushi Go Party version. But if you want to keep, if you want to keep it at light, uh, just stick with Sushi Go. Yeah, that one almost made it on my uh, list, but then I saw Justin was, you know, <laughs> I was like, can't go there too. So, yeah, I'm just gonna say I'm hungry now. Suzanne, <laughs> sushi for dinner tomorrow, I think. 
<laughs> uh, you can have sushi if you like. I will have something else. <laughs> I am not a fan of fish, if anyone is wondering. So, so when I think of summer, I think of it being hot and, you know, occasionally, depending on where you live, it might get pretty dusty. So my final game um, I decided to pick is Bang. Um, it's a classic for me. It's one of the ones I used to play all the time with my uh, gaming groups. Uh, it's by Mayfair Games and Da Vinci Games. The game is basically based on the Spaghetti Western. So the concept is really you play either either an outlaw, a renegade, deputy, or the sheriff. And the only person anybody knows is for sure is the sheriff every round. So roles are assigned randomly. You get a couple of characters you can pick from. And then really it's a it's a showdown in the town. So uh, it's it's a great kind of fun game. Um, you know, unlike some of the games, which I, you know, I you know, I, I hesitated putting this one at number one only because it really does need you know, four to seven players to really play well. Uh, you know, and the more players you have, it can be just a howl. But uh, the downside is, of course, if you uh, if you have a whole lot of players, you may find yourself sitting pretty quickly, depending on what your role is. So, uh, just really, uh, you know, it could be a very quick, fun game. You know, that doesn't usually take too long. But uh, it says it usually takes about twenty to forty minutes, which I find to be pretty accurate. The only time I've seen it go really long is when you have, um, you know, a bunch of people who are kind of stalemating each other versus actually playing. But uh, <laughs> But it's just kind of a fun, if you ever like the spaghetti western type things, you know, it's it's just very thematic. Um, and it is in that kind of same size box that I talked about with Flux. It's like, a, unless you get all of the expansions, in which case it comes in this wonderful bullet size thing that you probably shouldn't take through, through customs. Uh, but, uh, you know, other than that... You know, uh, it, it the base level game is just a double wide set of cards and um, super easy to transport, but a lot of fun. You can even take it to like, uh, you know, if you have a family that really enjoys doing it, you can have the whole family play or, you know, you can take a family reunion or whatever you want to do. So it's a lot of fun. I'll just say, Matt, that I played this game once at your house when we had your family and kids and my daughter, Ben, and I, and it actually was fun. You yeah. usually don't like those type of games, but it was silly. It was fun. We were all laughing, and it was quick to teach. So, yeah, this is a good yeah. game. I agree. Iconography is, I, you know, you had a couple other games we talked about earlier. We said the iconography is super, like, Super easy. It's not quite as easy as some of the other ones, but once you know it, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and if you get the original cards, they are, by the way, in um, Italian, because it's where the Spaghetti Western originated. So, Well, and that pretty much does it for our coverage of games that we feel, feel fit our summer-friendly gaming needs. What games do you absolutely find necessary for surviving those summer trips, family excursions, or just scream summer to you? Let us know on our social media like Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And if you weren't aware, Wisco Dice has a Discord, so make sure you join that. You can find all the information on all of our social media on wiscodice.com. In addition to our main topic of all of those summer-friendly family games, uh, we also covered today our miniature hobby projects that included several uh, Batman miniature game hobby projects from Stark and Conesy, as well as Matt's gaming table endeavors. And of course, we caught up on the games that we've been playing, and that included Fantastic Factories and Foundations of Rome. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure you leave a review of this show wherever your favorite place is to find podcasts. Oh, and by the way, give us a like on our Facebook page. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or Pinterest while you're at it. If you haven't looked recently, make sure you catch up on the blog at wiscodice.com. Hey, Brian, what's that site? 
Ah, oh, darn. I forget. Uh, Justin, what's our website again? Whiskodice.com. That's right. It's Whiskodice.com. And until next time, everyone, peace out.